But again, it's what you put into that generation of cow that is supposed to be an improvement over the, the old generation. So, so what is the purpose of the small farmer? I guess most of them really, you, you, if you talk about it, they, you think you can buy that small native cow from the farmer? He won't get rid of that because that's his cash cow. This is a small cow who gives birth every year. He will not sell that to me because it's, it's very important for him. So to have a cow, maybe you can breed Brahman on him and he'll sell the, the F1s. He'll sell the F1s. So it's not easy to accumulate the genetics that you're asking me to, to try to, to collect for that project of ours in Isabella. So be that as it may, the principles are the same. Whether there are five cows, 10 cows, 20 cows, it's still the same. It's still fertility, it's still productivity, and I guess you have to work at it. But you see, the thing is, most of these 96% people don't have access to the genetics that count. That, that is the problem. Because the genetics they have now are limited in their... By who offers it to them? Well, if it's a government program... Yes. If it's a government program, they have responsibility to yes. stand up tall. Yes. So this works, that fails. I can tell you a funny story. In today's values, it cost me over $2 million loss. Massive for a business my size. Massive. Well, I used genetics that were fashionable. I brought them in from other countries. They did not suit my environment. They did not suit my economy of operation. It was a most massive fail. I'll show you a chart on that where you look at the pregnancy rate in heifers by those bulls. Fortunately, we never threw out the adapted cattle. Now, adapted is a big word. Adapted means alive with minimal inputs and a baby produced. That's adapted. And most times, in my experience in the tropics, it must be the Zebu or Boss Indica strains of cattle. It must be. And the ones that are proven with good data will stand very tall in the market. A matter of having that semen available at the right price, but have people prepared to say, this is the gold standard, that is the dirt standard. Fertility, fertility, and fertility. <laughs> there's, and nothing, there's nothing else. <laughs> and the equation for adapted cattle is a calf on time, every time. And there are patterns, I've analyzed patterns by sire. You can have as low as 3% success rate on, on first calf pregnancies, or you can have it as high as 80%. Which one would you like? I want the 80. Definitely, I don't want the threes or the fives or the nines. I want the 70s and 80s. And that's driven by the bull's daughter's ability to function. For example, if all wonderful women had to be six feet tall, blue eyes and blonde hair, would we have a better world? Hell no! We think people, regardless of hair color, eye color or height, have a level of function. Okay. There's a purpose for breeding for calves and breeding for production in the feedlot. In other words, some people are looking at using F1s to produce a hybrid bigger animal for the feedlot that will make the top gains with the top feed. His, 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 uh, his uh, motive is just to get fat animals for sale in the shortest possible time. So that requires some crossbreeding. What do you say about that? I think it's mostly nonsense because appetite is depressed in this environment greatly by temperature and humidity. Yes. That's the first thing. Which you can control. You in can, the feedlot. If you're careful, you can, but it's very expensive it to have air-conditioned Yeah, it will, uh, we will see tomorrow. Uh, adaptation uh, uh, matters. Adaptation does matter. Yes, 
is, and I think it outweighs adaptation and, and reproduction, outweigh all other things. Agreed. Because you can have a model of a beautiful, and I have raised 13 different crosses and measured them for function. I'll give you an example. I had F1 European heifers that were 70 kilograms heavier than my general run of Brahmin heifers. They were 57% pregnant, maiden heifers. My Brahma heifers, 70 kilos lighter, 91% pregnant, on time. There's no, there's no debate. We're talking about fertility, functional gain. In the feedlot, yes. an F1 will gain weight more than a single straight breed. You know how much he ate? No. The, you you will you will you will measure all of that, but the the it's been measured. Yeah. So there's no value to to crossbreeding for feeding in this environment. If they're only half Cebu, in my opinion, no advantage at all. They're not adapted. When they get hot food, they're panting. They cannot control their their biological function. You need at least 75% adapted or zebu blood in this environment. In Northern Australia, where I operate, we need at least 75%. And what we found, remember, I'm old enough to have started with Bosch Taurus cattle. And they fail miserably when it comes to this metric of reproduction on time and returns per hectare. In, this, in the environment. In that environment. Tropical environment. Nowhere near as severe as here. Like this is severe environment, temperature and humidity is massive. And then you get heavy rain, which is tough on cattle as well. You need adapted species to optimize the return. Now, as far as I know, my daughter has worked and she was married into a feedlot family for seven years. And she knew how many tons went into a yard of cattle and what came out. She also, she also long fed a Japanese cattle for 600 days. And she knows how much that costs to get a kilogram back. Huge. Of course. But I can only deal with best. I can only speak best on what I know is tropical agriculture. There is no return for non-adapted cattle. I've measured so many different crosses. Now, I'll back that. Dr. Verko gave me a chart way back 35 years ago, or more or less, for Heterosis to be expressed, you need a perfect environment of temperature and humidity. From a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is more dead, at 0.7 on that scale, there is zero heterosis left. Zero. Zero what? Heterosis, hybrid bigger left. It cannot express unless the environment is managed. Scientific fact. If you research Dr. John Verko, CSIRO, he did this work 40 or 50 years ago. He gave me the chart in the mid 80s. I can show it to you one-on-one. -on -one. We won't put it on the camera because it's messy, but it's information that's worth thinking about. I don't have all the answers, but I do know it's failed for me and failed in my economic environment. And I believe the Philippines is more difficult environment again. Animals that are not adapted, people say, oh, we'll put them in that environment for two years and they'll be adapted. Rubbish. Biologically, they are not equipped to do it. They're just simply not. And we're blessed with zebu cattle. If you go back to native and adapted cattle publication by Dr. R.B. Kelly, there's photos of the cattle that made a name for the zebu breeds. The native ones become the domestic ones, and they were quite extraordinary. I thought it was inspirational. So I got hold of Dr. Kelly's book on genetics as well and looked at it and tried to understand it and never forgot the role of truly adapted cattle, Martin. That's the real important thing. Adaptation is the single biggest factor that will affect net return. And fertility is the ultimate measure of adaptation. Then it's all easy. My goodness, you talk to me. You buy all. <laughs> no, I'm saying, I'm saying. No, uh, hopefully we can work out the program where we can, we can, we can bring in more of the genetics so our people can access more and see for themselves. 
and uh, it's nice if you have a choice. It's always nice. It's very hard if you have no choice. Very hard. Especially for here. And tra tradition weighs very heavily on people's minds. The traditional way of doing it. The traditional way the agricultural extensionists have observed the industry. They don't want to upset people. They want to say, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job, you know. But we've all got to break new ground. The future is mighty important. We've got to live in it. And Alison, you, people your age, they're the gold in this whole. You're interested in what you do. Uh, he's old already. <laughs> uh, yeah, RJ is young. But that's the future. And Very old. Look, but, I, uh, I was really blessed to have a, an innovative and courageous father. He introduced me to leading scientists when I was a boy. And I couldn't get enough of them. I'd buy their books, I'd get the bulletins that they released. I read them and reread them, and it made so much sense. But it's not commonly discussed.